Let's give Jesus a hand, everybody. For, for happy living on the face of this earth, you need to be well. It is the will of God that you be well. Isn't that nice? I don't ever have to pray for you and say, if, if, if the Lord wills, he'll heal you. That's just plain stupid. It is the Lord's will. Christ came and died that you might have wholeness and completeness and healing by his mighty power. And, and so God doesn't re review his will every Saturday night. Whatever he has said, he has said, you know. And, and, and so uh, he's not changing his mind about it. He wants to heal. And all he wants of us is to trust and to believe. Now, I've lived in the foreign lands uh, at least half of my life, and I love the foreign lands. And I'm asking this country, why do we see more phenomenal healings in other lands than we do here? And the only answer I would know is this. Number one, the people have just been taught it. It's fresh. Some of us have known it for a long time until it's pretty dull. And, and it, it is fresh. And they have just grasped it. And they have such trust in you as the one that spoke it to them. That you have spoken the truth. And then it coordinates with the word of God and they say, you know, I believe it. You say it. The word says it. And I accept it. And then the other is, <laughs> nine-tenths of them don't have a round dime in the world. They couldn't buy an aspirin tablet. You say, what do you mean? It means you're the only one they can go to. That there is no other hope. They can't say, well, if, if you don't heal me, I'll just go to the hospital. There aren't any hospitals to go to. And if there were, they don't have any money to get in. And so your prayer is the final answer to them. And neighbors, when you work in the finality of things, there's a different feeling about it, you know? When, you, when, you, when you're in the final issue that it's this or nothing, you feel very different about it. And so we do see tremendous things take place there. But God does not love them more than he loves you. And that God can do as great things for you as he does anyone else in the whole world. We are studying human illness and divine healing. And in the lesson that we are contemplating at the present time is called Bible Reasons that illness comes to people. And we discovered in, in this likeness that, that sin entered the world through transgression. And if we just hold that up as a basis that say a sin and, and sickness are, 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 are related together, that one got here the way the other one, and we, then we relate that actually sickness is just limited death. Uh, that when sickness gets a hold of you, that is death. And if it gets a hold of you too big, then it's all finished with you. And, and so it has to be taken off of you. We discovered many things about things that cause uh, sickness. And, and one of them was fear, bringing an actual sickness upon people. Uh, medical doctors have said that some people have actually died of fear. That fear grabbed them and terrorized them until they stopped living. They died. That fear became an enormous situation that they could not handle with their heart, with their brain, or with any other part of their being, and that they, they died. In 1 John 4 and 18, at the bottom of page 23 in your syllabus, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casteth out fear. Now, now, you have to analyze that just a little bit. It's amazing that, that, uh, that fear has to do with sickness, and hate has to do with sickness, and un unforgiveness has to do with sickness, and love has to do with health. It might mean that you're, if you got full of love, <laughs> it would throw out all the disease that passed by your door anyway. It says, there is no fear in love, Perfect love casteth out this malignancy called fear. Fear hath torment, the Bible says. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. God is love. God is love. And the perfection of God in our lives cast out all fears. 
And in Hebrews 13 and 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now that's a promise that will take fear out of you, and it will be gone forever. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what men, what man can do to me. That when you've got a place in God that you're sure of, then you don't have to fear anything on the face of this earth. You can't die but once, no matter how hard you try. <laughs> the worship of idols can bring human illness. Uh, the the, the, the non-Christian world is a sick world. And they have a lot to be thankful for in that America has built hospitals for them and sent them doctors and nurses, literally by the hundreds. And, and uh, they're very thankful for that. Uh, the, the world without God, the true God, is a sick world. And we have people in this country that says, I leave the heathen alone and don't bother them. Honey, you've never seen them. You ought to go look at them. They, they're sick. And they're sick in every way. Think of a person imagining monsters coming after them. Don't you want me to cast the monsters away? And say to the devil, stop bringing these. I cut you off right now. I put the blood of Jesus around this person and you can never manifest again. Go! And he's gone. Isn't that worth something? Huh. Look, they walk in gladness and they walk in peace because Satan was coming against them as a monster and I told him to leave and made him leave, drew the bloodline around them and then they walk in love and walk in joy. So you can't tell me, leave them alone, they're happy. You don't know anything about them if you say they're happy. How you just saw some photographer clip a picture, it was all, and somebody had a giddy grin. But you live with them like we've lived with them, and they start pouring out their sorrows to you. Their sorrows go back for generations of, of mistreatment in one another, and hurt that goes back for generations. And it takes the healing master to make it all right, and to make it good, and that's exactly what he wants to do. In Exodus chapter 20, uh, in verse 4, it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee graven images, that's things to worship that you engrave and make from stone or wood. Or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And that's beginning your commandments, you know. Thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity. There you are. Uh, heathenism and demon worship can bring all kinds of problems. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, maybe you don't know it, but all pagan and heathen religions is rebellion. Uh, in this country, we haven't been taught much about those people. And, and we have the complete the wrong ideas about them. The number one thing we say they're ignorant. But I got news for you. There's not an ignorant human being on the face of this earth. You say, well, why would you say that? Well, I've been to Tibet, and I went to tribes that had never seen a watch, never seen one, never seen a camera, ne had never seen one. And I, with my interpreter, I move over to a man. I said, uh, you're a nice looking man. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you have a woman? Uh, yes. If, if that man over there takes your woman tonight, what'd you do for him? I'll kill him. Well, what would you do that for? He shouldn't take my woman. Well, I said, that's what the Bible says. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I said, now, if you have a, a, a horse there, and while you're looking the other way, I, I, I take your horse. Uh, what you going to do? I'm going to kill you. <laughs> well, why? Well, you took my horse. Well, that's what the Bible says. Thou shalt not steal. You can find the most primitive people on the face of the earth, and they know the Ten Commandments. You hear me? Oh, you say, well, how about the gods? I have talked to some of the most primitive people living, and you know what they'll say? I worship this lower God, and I ask him to help me to the upper one. I'm afraid of the big God. Isn't that a sneaky devil? <laughs> that tells them they can't reach the big God and just come to him? Isn't that something? Now, I mean, not, not a few. I guarantee you there are millions living right now that are worshiping the devil that'll tell you, well, we talked, we, we had an hour with the witch doctor. You can, you can get the tape uh, here in the office. Uh, we had an hour and a half with the witch doctor down, down in South Africa. 
And he told us, he said, beyond any of this that we know here, there is one greater. And he says, someday I hope to reach him. You see, he's dealing with these demons. Hopefully one day he'll get through to the other side of them. You can get to the other side real quick. The blood of Jesus Christ will take you right straight through. <laughs> and you, you won't get back into it anymore. God will set you free. If you're glad for it, say amen. amen. But we are sure that if your parents are, are in this type of thing, that Jesus can, can break uh, that third and fourth generation thing. He can destroy that. You don't have to suffer that. And when you come to God, he can say, wait a minute, you're asking forgiveness, I forgive you, and he will break it. But those people that you know out there as heathen, please don't think they're stupid and don't think they're ignorant because I've already talked to them for you. And they do know right and wrong, but they deliberately do what's wrong. They do steal and they do commit adultery because they want to and they know it. it and you read Romans, what Romans says about it. It says they should be judged, they should be judged by, by the book. But they should be judged by their own hearts, their own conscience, you know, and it tells you about it. Now, what are some reasons why, why people can become ill? One that we really don't like to talk about, and yet uh, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that many thousands of people are sick because of this one here, your number 10. Many thousands of people. In 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 30, it says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. They took the communion when they had no right to take it. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. The Holy Communion is for holy people. And you better believe it. Now, in some churches, I think they give it to little children. Now, it tells you in this same scripture here in 1 Corinthians that if you receive the communion, you must understand what you're doing. You must understand what you're doing or you should not take Holy Communion. Children should not, take, should not take Holy Communion until you know they are saved in your home and you know they are saved because of the little sweetness of spirit that's come into their lives. And that has nothing to do with an age. It can be seven or it can be nine, it can be 11, but you are the judge of that. But the big thing that I want to talk to you there there are church people that take communion and they're not saved and they're given communion and then they wonder why they're sick. Now, you ought to study that whole area there and that because it's very, very important. There are a couple of very holy things that we are supposed to do. One of them is to be baptized in water. Now, you're not to be baptized in water until you know your sins are forgiven because baptism means to dip. It comes from a Greek word that means to dip. And it has to do with you being dead to your sins. And you're buried in waters of baptism. That's in Romans chapter 6. They that are buried in waters of baptism shall so rise with him in resurrection. Those that are buried with Christ in baptism. And, and uh, water baptism is for a person that knows he's saved. And then it's a public witness that he says, see, I'm buried. I'm gone. I'm dead. And now I'm up. I'm alive. I'm resurrected. It's a witness and a testimony to the inside of us. And another is the Holy Communion. It should only be taken by people that know they're saved. And when you do, the bread speaks of your healing, by his stripes you're healed, and the fruit of the vine speaks of our salvation, that we're cleansed by the precious blood. It's the most sacred thing that we have to offer in Christianity. And I know that you understand this, but you should teach others about it. That some are sick, the Bible says, weak and sick. And says so some are prematurely dead for, because they didn't recognize the sacredness of the Holy Communion. Your number 11 says, God's promise of health. In Proverbs 4, 18, the path of the just is as a shining light. You like that? Amen. That shineth more and more under the perfect day. I like it. The justified is a person that has been redeemed from his sins and cleansed from his sins. So the path of the justified is as a shining light that shineth more and more under the perfect day. Verse 19, the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Isn't that amazing? That didn't that give you a picture of our world today. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Lest, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health unto their flesh. You see? 
their health under their flesh. We've got to know that healing has something remarkable to do with the way that we live every day of our lives before God. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let thy ways be established. Turn not in the right hand nor the left. Remove thy foot from evil. And, and there is a path of, of wholeness, of, of a, a well body, and a well mind, and, and a well spirit when we walk in that way. Now we come to the beautiful part of this lesson in that Christ has now redeemed us from any of these curses uh, that has brought sickness upon the human race. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, it is almost one of the golden texts of the Bible, you know. It says, the thief cometh, that's the devil. He cometh not, but for to steal. When the devil comes, he'll steal your health, steal your happiness, steal your goods. He is a thief. The thief cometh, which is the devil. He cometh not, but to, to steal, and he will kill. He'll just cut it right down. It don't matter how beautiful it is. He'll cut it right down. To kill, he is a destroyer and to destroy. And Jesus says, but I am come that you may have life and that you may have life more abundantly. That is one of the great verses of the whole Bible. Now, if you want to put a, uh, a little beautiful thing on your wall, well, paint that one up and put it on there. John 10 and 10. That the devil has come, you can put it just like the Bible says it. The thief cometh not, but to steal to kill and to destroy. Jesus says, I am come that you may have life. When Jesus comes, he brings life to the body, the soul, the spirit, and you may have it more abundantly. I like that more abundantly part of it. I like a lot of anything I like. <laughs> yeah, I don't ever go in for short measures. Anything I like, I like a lot of it. And he says that you might have life more abundantly. 1 John 3 and 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. The devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy all the works of the devil. And, and so if the devil has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, Jesus has come to destroy those things and to take them away. He has redeemed us from the curse. In Galatians 3, 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And so the Lord Jesus Christ came that he might redeem us from any curse that the devil may have upon us. And that brings us to a tremendous thought. It's in your lesson four in your syllabus. Is sickness a blessing or a curse? Now, you, you say, now, now Brother Summerall, everybody knows that sickness is a curse. Now, that's just what you think. I've met a lot of people that said, I'm suffering for Jesus. <laughs> yeah. And they were having a hard time doing it too. And they weren't smiling about doing it for Jesus either. Oh, the Lord, the Lord has put this upon me. And he's trying to discipline my life. He's trying to bring me into a place of faith. And he'll take you into a place of doubt in that way. And that is not the way he draws people closer to him. Jesus Christ did not come in this world to bring disease upon your body or anybody else's body. He fully stated that he had come to, to take away disease and to heal people of all their diseases. And yet, you're going to find millions of Christians out there that's going to say, now, no, uh, sometimes uh, sickness is a blessing. <laughs> well, I, I got one little nasty question to ask you then. If it's such a blessing, uh, leave that bottle of medicine alone. Don't stop the blessing. <laughs> and, and leave the doctor alone. Don't let him steal your blessing from you. There you are. 
In the Gospel of John chapter 9, it's verse 1, it says, Jesus passed by and saw a man who was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? People always have to relate some kind of tragedy uh, with a negative situation. And uh, they, they want to blame it on somebody. And they said, this man, I don't see how they could have concocted that one. This man didn't sin before he got born, and he was blind when he got born. And they, 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 they thought that he was born blind because he was going to sin later. I don't think that's in the Bible, that judgment comes before you do bad, you know. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, that was a feeling of people, that surely somebody had transgressed if there was a situation like that. And so this letter, uh, letter this lesson is again centered and a controversy that you will find as you go out from our class to, to speak to others. And we do not want to be part of a controversy relating to divine truth. Our lesson is in the form of a question, and, and we shall seek God's answer, the Bible answer, and we believe that's a spiritual answer. And so we have to begin slowly with it. Number one, is this disease natural? Then in order to answer that, we'd have to look at nature. Have you seen a sick tree? I have. We've cut some down around, 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 around here close by. Is it a thing of beauty? And is it natural? Maybe you'd have to say, no, it sure isn't pretty. When, when it won't grow any more leaves, and, 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 and the branches start, stop dropping, dropping off of it, and rot starts coming out of it, and the next wind's gonna blow it over, do you say, oh, that's the most beautiful little tree I've ever seen? <laughs> Something's wrong with your head. <laughs> we look at nature first, and then we look at diseases such as tuberculosis. Of course, in these days, you don't get to see a real tubercular. When I was a little boy, you did. When you, you see a human weighing about 60 pounds, and he's coughing up his life all day long and, and all night long. Uh, I've seen the last stages of tu tuberculosis, not only for myself, but for many people. And out in the Orient, uh, they, they really have tuberculosis. And I guess in most of the poor countries, they have a lot of tuberculosis from exposure. And, and uh, are you see cancer? Are you see any other crippling disease? There's only one question I want to ask you. Do you see the image of, of a God of love there? Can you, can you find there the image of God's love? I, I, can't, I can't see any. Now, when it comes to what we've been teaching you already relative to uh, the curse that was in Egypt, in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26, uh, that he says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's in the last part of the verse there. I am the Lord that healeth thee. Uh, that uh, sickness was a curse, and he brought him out of the curse into healing. It was, sickness was not a blessing. When we come to a person like Miriam, we find that, we find that sickness was a curse. In Numbers uh, chapter 12 and verse 10, the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. He had to send her outside the camp, and she was his own sister, and she had been critical of her brother, who was the leader, who was the leader of the nation, and she was cursed with leprosy. And she did not get healed until he prayed for her. And so uh, it was a curse. Sickness was a curse as far as she was concerned. In 2 Chronicles 16, verse 12, it says, And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceedingly great. Yet in his disease he sought not to Jehovah, but to the physicians. And Asa slept with his fathers and died in one and fortieth year. When he was forty-one years old, he died. And in the thirty ninth year he was sick. And he never did seek God. And, and, and so he died. And so we, we don't find that sickness is a blessing and, and that we should say, hey, Lord, let me get sick so I can be blessed. <laughs> I don't think that's the kind of blessing I'm looking for. And, and uh, I think we want to get it out of our minds that sickness is something that God gives us in order to draw us closer to him. Uh, uh, the way that, that, that God draws me closer to him is this. He fills me so full of his goodness 
and his mercies, and he gives me so many good things, I just fall down before him and said, I love you, I love you, I love you, you're so good, you're so great, you're so wonderful, I just love you. But if I was sick in bed, I don't know what I'd say. It wouldn't be funny at all, I can tell you. But that is not the way that it works. A sickness in the Bible was a curse. And when Jesus met people, and in your point number four, and they had devils in them, uh, Jesus healed those people. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. And that's in Mark 1 and 34. And so it was not, it was not a blessing. They had all kinds of diseases. And Jesus didn't say, now let me see, this is going to draw you closer to God. You keep that one. And this one's going to help you be spiritual. You keep that one. The Bible says that he drove the whole bunch of them out along with the devil. Told all of them to get out. And the Lord sent forth his disciples and told them to heal. He told them specifically that they were to go out and to heal people. I don't think we should go out with any less of his anointing upon our lives and any less of his burden upon our lives. I have a great burden to see people healed. I have a great burden to see people healed. Something within me desires to see people healed. I am not comfortable and I don't feel you're getting spiritual. And I don't lay hands on you and say, Lord, back them sicker so they'll get better. <laughs> you, know, one thing, you wouldn't ask me back the second time. You'd say, you might give me a third dose <laughs> and I'd die. No. no, sickness is a curse and it is not a blessing to the human race. It didn't come because men were good, it came because men were bad. It didn't originate in goodness, it originated in badness. And you say, what's going to happen in eternity? There won't be any sickness in heaven. There'll be no pain, no disease, and no sickness, and no death. And so therefore we know that it's not on the right side. It's not on the positive side. 